Welcome everyone uh, to the conference, Errands by the Version War Museum. As we all know, the title of the conference is the Version War Museum Global Virtual Conference on Commemorating First Genocides and Learning to Prevent Atrocity Crimes. Uh, but uh, the theme of our panel is uh, oral history in documenting past atrocities. We know that nowadays oral history has become a very uh, well-known methodology in the field of uh, especially anthropology, um, sociology, and also history. We are all using it. And uh, we have now with us two of our distinguished panelists. One is uh, Dr. Indira Choudhury, and the title of her presentation is uh, Roots or Home? Oral histories of disrupted lives, uh, who herself has experience, as far I uh, know, and uh, so the uh, little abstract uh, she actually sent me from that bird that she has uh, the experience. Her, she experienced herself the trauma or the uh, disruption. So. Um, I would like to say at first that uh, each of my panelists will get only 15 minutes. So I don't want to kill any more time. Uh, just I want to share, uh, start with the biography or the little introduction of uh, our panelists. Uh, so uh, Dr. Indira Choudhury is founder director of the Center for Public History at the Sristi Institute of Art, Design and Technology which is situated in Bangalore. And formerly, she used to be a professor of English at Jadavpur University, Kolkata. She is also the founder archival resource for contemporary history, Bangalore, uh, which is also known as ARCH at Sristi. And her book, The Frail Hero and Viral History, which actually won the Tagore Prize in 2001. And Indira is a founding member of the Oral History Association of India. She was president of Actually, maybe she's facing some problem, network problem. I hear you now. I missed the last bit. Should I start? Uh, I think uh, you can start. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Afreen. So I will just share my screen. I have titled my talk Roots or Home because these two words keep, you know, coming whenever we do oral histories to with those who have been dispossessed because, I mean, mainly I have worked with people who have been affected by partition. Uh, it's not my experience, but really the experience of some members of my family who I've interviewed. But I'll also talk here a little bit about somebody I have interviewed who was, who experienced that violence and uh, came as a refugee to India from Bangladesh during the Liberation War. And I think what I'm trying to talk about here is how they are less overt processes of violence. Not all violence is not always very visible. It's not always something that grabs our uh, you know, news channels. So, you know, there might be other forms of violence that can affect generations, not just the generation that witnesses it, experiences it, but also later generations. So, oral history is one of the ways in which we can understand that. The Bangla word for, uh, you know, the, the refugee is Utbastu, someone who's been uprooted. And, you know, this search for roots or search for, you know, because they're also rendered homeless at the same time. They can never return to the place that, uh, you know, the, the, they uh, came from. And this is, again, one form of very slow violence that we sometimes don't acknowledge. 
So I'm uh, really going to talk about this unacknowledged trauma and that's why I call it oral histories of disrupted lives. So to begin with, you know, the partition that, uh, you know, as we know, framed uh, the histories of both our countries. And uh, it was, in a way, uh, a very, very arbitrary, hurriedly drawn line, the Radcliffe line, the boundary commissions that were, you know, there were two lines that were drawn, one in the West, one in the East. And of course, if we look at newspapers of that time, this is a paper, August 18th, as you know, the partition was announced in August uh, 17th. You have that, you see that there is no agreed solution. There's a wide divergence of opinion. And in spite of that, you know, this goes ahead. There are towns which are in India as well as uh, Bangladesh now, uh, which were in one side or the other for one day. And then again, the next day they were told, no, you belong to this country and not that. So it, of course, created this kind of, you know, forced migration, a lot of fear in people. And of course, these trains we see, I often look at this and wonder, did they reach where they were going? Did they, were they killed on the way? As we know, you know, there was a lot of bloodshed. There was a lot of, you know, communities attacking each other and killing each other. And I think this is what, you know, when I look at the whole perspective of uh, mass atrocities that, you know, people have been looking at, and I know that your conference has looked at Somalia, has looked at a whole range of, you know, mass atrocities that have happened across the world. This struck me as very important that, you know, when you confront mass atrocities through oral history practice, you, you find that, you know, what has happened as a result of mass atrocities, the, the social fabric, the social ties that bind human groups together have been ripped apart. And what you have is there's an obliterate iterating of language, family, culture. So, and of course, to add to it, there is also, you know, the destruction of physical and economic infrastructure. I think this is what happened during the partition. Unlike, let's say, uh, you know, countries where the state itself was very violent towards its citizens, as we see in uh, you know, Argentina, the dirty war, I have actually been to their memorial uh, museums and parks and uh, it kept me silent for a certain period of time where one couldn't talk seeing what had been done. So unlike that, what happened during partition, there was something very, uh, very violent, but not always talked about. And that's why Urvashi Butalia, who's written a lot about the partition and one of our foremost scholars, has said for Indians, remembering partition means recalling the dark side of independence, a moment of loss, a moment when the country was divided and that which was lost was immeasurable. For it was not only homelands and families and material things, but much more that could not be articulated, sometimes not even named. And when Ashish Nandi starts looking at this, uh, he says, you know, actually he makes a stronger statement. He says independence came packaged in genocide, necrophilia, ethnic cleansing, mass uprooting and the collapse of a moral universe. When a few of us began interviewing the surviving witnesses of that period, we found that many of them traced the disintegration of their society to the period. And after living through the partition, they knew the brutalization that was its bequest to South Asian public life. But the, pre, the generation that followed actually banished the memories of partition. And with that, they felt they had banished genocidal theory and exterminatory fantasies 
that had devastated large parts of British India. And as he goes on to say how wrong this was, this forgetting was really not the right approach. In my own interviews, this is uh, Kamla Mankekar, who's one of the first women journalists in India who came as a refugee from Lahore to Delhi. And she talked to me about how, you know, even the leaders at that time drew a curtain on the suffering of people who had come from the other side. And she says even Punjabis by nature did not talk too much about their grief. Their attitude was, what has happened has happened. If we keep on harping on the past, we will never get anywhere. There were terrible things that had happened to families in the kafilas. Kafilas were these huge uh, human columns of people that moved from Pakistan, West Pakistan into Punjab. The mobs came, families were butchered. They pulled out young girls, raped them in the presence of their fathers and brothers. I can't tell you the terrible things that happened. Not only Hindus were butchered, Muslims too were butchered. Why did any of them not talk? I think for one thing, the government did not encourage. But I also think it was the migrant attitude. I won't call them refugees. They were migrants. They did not beg, borrow or seek charity. They were too proud of people. And they just tried to reestablish themselves. That is why they did not talk. We have, after 70 years of Indian independence, finally a partition museum. And the partition museum has a number of um, things that artifacts it has collected from people, things they brought with them across the border. And some of it are artistic, they are oral histories. As you can see, I'm watching uh, someone rec recollect, uh, you know, their crossing of the border. But there's also artistic uh, intervention. For instance, this well, very movingly, this well in the middle of one of those exhibition spaces remind you of the suicides women uh, sort of did by jumping into wells when they were being attacked rather than being raped, to escape from being raped. And it is very, very poignant. It is. Uh, you know, when you see that, you realize that, you know, it's trying to tell that violent story. I want to come very briefly to my own family. Uh, and I have to say that I have not talked to many of these people uh, for uh, until very recently. The person you see here is my great grandfather, Prakash Chandra Dashgupta, who refused to move to India. He lived on in Kumilla and he said, this is my home and I know everybody here, nothing is going to happen to me. And the family too, they all, and this is his family, you can see that this is his youngest daughter who I interviewed, his other daughter, this is his uh, eldest daughter's daughter, that's his wife and that's their eldest son who worked in Kolkata. And for a while he had taught in Brahman Bariya College. Now, what is interesting about this family is that because they did not, you know, they continued working in India and they felt that they could always go back, that, you know, the border was not going to be sealed in that way. This, by the way, is my cousin, who's among the few who are around. When I was talking to my father's aunt, this is how she began her oral history. And it was a very unusual beginning. She said, you know, from 66, I don't think of 30th July as my birthday. It was the day my father died. And why this hurt remained with her is that after the war of 1965 with Pakistan, she could not visit again and communication lines were closed. Not just that, she says that our father had a trusted assistant, Human Mia, who knew what was to be done with the money and with the property. But my mother never got in touch with him and everything was taken away by a relative. Had she contacted him, she would be taken care of. Our relative sold portions of the house and did not give any money to my mother. In the few months, she could not manage there and was living in great poverty. We brought her to India through one of the borders in North 
24 Parganas. Now, this great grandmother of mine had, towards the end of her life, lost her mind and she just lived in that house that she left behind. She would talk about it as if, you know, it was there. Kolkata was just too congested, too dark. The house was very small, her son's house. And she constantly, you know, would just mutter these things which sometimes we didn't understand. And we realize only later, as Urvashi Butalia tells us, for many of these women, this was their inability to negotiate the borders. So this is the slow violence I'm talking about that you can only get to know from others. That's her photograph. I want to come now to another, you know, that the borders between our two countries remained very porous for a long time. There was a lot of going and coming, but this one is not a happy going and coming. This is just before, you know, uh, just uh, during the Pakistan war, and you find that, uh, you know, this is something that begins to disturb the world. And this is Joshua Road, where a lot of refugees came and, uh, you know, began to live in, uh, these are big pipes, they're living inside that. And this is what Allen Ginsberg, who visits Kolkata at that time, begins to protest about. And years later, my friend Moushumi Bhomik, uh, actually, she doesn't translate Allen Ginsberg's song, but she writes her own poetry. And I'm going to play this for a minute. Ma'am, we can't hear anything. Huh? You can't hear? No, ma'am. Um, maybe there is some problem from your part uh, because I can hear the song. Oh, okay. Okay. Shall I continue or? Y yes, y you can continue. Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you. I hope you will, uh, you know, hear the full song. I'm sorry that I'm not able to play the whole thing. But the point I'm trying to make is that oral history is the way in which we uh, gather uh, information or the processes by which people make meaning of their lives by interviewing them. But there are also songs poetry that's written around that time that actually gives you insights into what that human suffering was. This is Jugal Rani or Jugal Rani Sharkar, who I've interviewed only recently, and she lives with us now. She actually, for the first time, started talking about, you know, she's someone who's gone back and forth many times. And again, she comes back. Here she talks about how when Pakistan becomes Bangladesh, they all went back. But very, very unfortunately, her husband just very irresponsibly sold everything and disappeared. And she was left with her three children. And she then decides to come to her uncle's house, which is on this side of the border. But I think what is very uh, sad is that she keeps, sorry, she keeps talking about, you know, the terrible days she's seen. And this is what I mean by, you know, the effects of, um, you know, when, when people get displaced, when they run away from genocide, when they run away from, you know, what is happening to them, when their lives are in danger. And you find that uh, 
you know, this is an unacknowledged trauma that oral history can uh, actually give voice to. And that is why we need to collect these because as Ashish Nandi again tells us, the past cannot be shed so easily. Like a disowned self dogging the steps of a patient who cannot yet own up to his or her illness, the past traumata of a collectivity too haunt not only the direct victims and the perpetrators, but also the following generations, which inherit without as much as an exchange of a word on the subject, the fears, anxieties, tensions, often even the homicidal fantasies a genocide throws up. Unlike an unexamined life, which we are told is not worth living, an unexamined past has to be lived out over the succeeding generations. And I think he makes a very bold statement that if you look at India and the way we still continue to, you know, drum up a certain kind of nationalism and a certain, and, and you have horrible riots even now, you find he, he is saying it's because we haven't come to terms with that past. And I think this is where oral history can serve as a reminder. And with my thanks to all of you here, as well as the people I've interviewed and my family who's spoken to me very generously, and Mofidul, who actually invited me to present here, I thank all of you and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Appa, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm very sorry at first that I was disconnected. Uh, there is some uh, internet issue from my part, uh, but uh, I have not actually missed much. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I went which... two minutes over time, but... <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, that is why I give you this message so that you could uh, finish your time pro uh, on your time. Uh, uh, so right now, uh, Prakriti, who is also another panelist of ours, I would like to share a short introduction of her. Uh, she is a researcher of social history and art history. So both are very interesting. She graduated as a history and English major from Mount Holyoke College in 2019. She's interested in using oral history methodologies to reconstruct hidden or subaltern narratives, particularly the underrepresented voice of the Bangladeshi woman. She is also currently working as a consultant at a development NGO while carrying out preliminary research for a graduate project on the contribution of female artisans to the historical development art style which is, I think, uh, quite unique in this time. So, Prakriti, you can now start your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Apu. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, hello. So today I'm going to be um, explaining some of the research that I did with the Liberation War Museum in Bangladesh using their very unique oral history archive. And um, I will explain why this is such a unique archive. And it's because of the method that is used to collect these testimonies for the museum. So unlike the more traditional um, way of doing oral history, which is through interviews, so a professional historian um, interviews a subject and then transcribes the interview. The Liberation War Museum actually asks school children across Bangladesh, um, across every single district of Bangladesh, to collect these testimonies from their elders in their communities and then send in these testimonies to the museum. And it does so by sending um, this bus, which is a mobile museum with exhibits, to different schools across sub districts. Um, and then engaging these children with the history of the liberation war and then encouraging them to pursue that um, with their families and their communities. <laughs> and the, the project organizers make, um, make sure to reach out to schools that are from across a variety of um, 
backgrounds. So schools that are big and large, urban and rural, girls' schools and madrasas to make sure that they have um, a wide diversity of participants. And the results from this project have been quite huge. There are over 50,000 oral testimonies in the archive um, from over 432 subdistricts. And most significantly, there is over 50% female participation. Um, so the students who are sending in these, these testimonies are mostly female. And more interestingly, the people they are interviewing, so the people who are sending in their testimonies are also mostly female. Um, so I think maybe Indira Abba might know that Sometimes it is difficult for an oral historian to convince um, a female subject to really open up about their trauma in front of a stranger. Um, but what is interesting about this project is that they are not opening up to someone who is a stranger or to someone who is higher in status, in perceived status than them. They are talking about this to a young person in their family who, um, who is considered um, to be who is considered their dependent. And so what these children are sending into the museum are the stories that get passed down a family. Um, and I was able to look through um, almost the entire archive. Um, I spent six months in the museum looking through the oral history archive. And while seeing all these different narratives um, from across so many different districts, um, I was able to pick up on the ways that these different narratives inform each other and the similarities that came up throughout these different testimonies. And I noticed that certain patterns and themes would, um, would be quite prevalent among different testimonies. And I was able to investigate two of those patterns that I thought were relevant to my own research interests. The first off are the, um, the war, wartime folk narratives that started to um, circulate around that time. So these are mainly word of mouth stories. They are not necessarily stories that the eyewitnesses themselves saw happening. They're more likely um, stories that they heard from someone else and then passed down to their children. But what is interesting about these stories is that is that they show that they have an almost isopian element to them. Um, if you remember the story about um, the hare and the tortoise, there is this element of an underdog kind of outsmarting someone who is naturally more powerful than them. And um, so in this case, the underdogs are unarmed Bangladeshi villagers, laymen, who use their... Um, who use their street smarts essentially, or their inherited knowledge to outsmart um, the militia, the very armed and very dangerous Pakistani militia. And here are some extracts from these stories where they show how these villagers basically use um, the knowledge of the countryside around them. So the knowledge about um, food like jackfruit or chili peppers, um, or the knowledge about how to navigate a riverine land or a monsoon, like waterlogged thing um, to outsmart the Pakistanis and, and gain an advantage even though they are unarmed. And these wartime stories um, show us not just a way that the people of the villages um, motivated themselves during the war, but it also shows a certain, um, the development of a united Bangladeshi identity in a way that is set in these rural um, local symbols that um, makes use of the things that someone in the countryside would grow up seeing, like the vegetation or the rivers and they turn it into part of the imagination of a new country of Bangladesh and its identity as a country that is separate from Pakistan. This I think is very, um, this was fascinating to me because I think that in Bangladesh, when we learn about the history of the liberation war, 
And when we learn about who the important players of the Liberation War are, there is an impression that there was um, a very top-down um, dissemination of this nationalism. So we learned that there were these middle-class players, so people from Dhaka University, political um, players from the Alma League, who, um, who kind of set these boundaries of nationalism, whose ideas were um, spread throughout the countries and, and um, their ideas were what inspired Bangladeshi nationalism. However, here we see that beyond these ideas that spread um, through these middle-class outlets, there were also these more independent um, developments of nationalism. So things that centered, um, things that centered what you find in a countryside. And this, I think, fills in a certain gap of the knowledge we have about how did an entire nation of people, which were mostly people from the countryside, people from agricultural societies, and how exactly did they end up being so passionate about the war that they would eventually win, about the identity that they fought a war um, to claim. The second part of um, these patterns that I noticed was the, was the presence of the non-combatant woman. So these are women who did not fight in the war, but also women who would not be categorized as Girangonas. Um, <clears throat> they were women who played the parts that society considers um, common or mundane for women who um, took care of their households during the war and took care of their families and fed freedom fighters and sheltered them. We see in these narratives that even though society may consider these roles to be mundane or um, common, these women do not necessarily see it that way. Many of these women in the testimonies mention that um, they are proud of the role that they played in the liberation work, of the fact that they protected their families and um, kept their children alive and that they looked out for their family's interests. And alongside that, they were also able to provide for the freedom fighters. Sorry. There's um, the role of food is very prominent in these female testimonies. They talk about disrupted meals as a recurring pattern to the narratives. Um, so a lot of narratives start with a family sitting down at a meal and the Pakistani army um, disrupting that meal. And then the family has to go away or hide, hide somewhere in the forest. And what we know is that there was a severe food shortage in 1971 and that carried on to 1972 and that this food shortage affected um, everyone currently in Bangladesh. So the civilians, the freedom fighters, and even the Pakistani militia who were not always receiving food shipments from West Pakistan. But even within this context, um, these women were preparing rice, preparing kituri and muri for freedom fighters. They were risking um, being targeted by the Pakistani army by opening up their doors to freedom fighters and sheltering them. And if we consider that, um, I think it does make sense that these women see themselves as um, worthy of recognition, who see themselves as having um, contributed to the victory of Bangladesh in the liberation war. It, um, the fact that they are saying these stories um, within this intimate environment of the home, I think is important because they are, because this is how they want to be remembered by the youngest members of their families. And, and it is important that they think there is something to be remembered about this. Um, the fact that 
they spent this period of the Liberation War um, providing services for the household and taking charge of the household is not something that they dismiss. This is something that they think um, contributed to the victory of Bangladesh in the Liberation War. And I think oftentimes when we read the more mainstream histories of this period, that's not how these women are presented. Um, um, they are not presented as being essential to victory the way that a freedom fighter or a political player is. But um, because of these oral histories, we can see that the story they want to tell about themselves is a little different from this mainstream history. So I think that as we were saying um, in Indirapa's presentation, about the human dimensions right, of history and how um, people tell these stories because um, they want an outlet for what um, something that happened to them and they want to be heard and that can be cathartic or even therapeutic. I think because of that, um, this archive, which is full of the stories that get passed down in a family, um, is so important because it shows us truly um, the stories that someone wants to tell about themselves, um, regardless of what the overarching narrative is about them. And this archive um, definitely cannot replace a more professionally done oral history method, mostly because there is no possible way to guarantee um, accuracy or um, factual, um, factual accuracy in these stories. Um, if you read through the different, um, the different testimonies, you will see actually that there are places where it seems quite obvious that there is exaggeration or omission, or they're telling a story that they do not seem to have witnessed themselves. But what is important is not so much the factual accuracy here as the fact that this is a narrative that someone has chosen to tell on their own terms. And this is the way that they want their story to be recorded um, in history. And because of that, I think that um, this archive can be, I'm almost done, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, because of that, I think that this archive can be useful um, to professional oral historians as well, if they wish to um, if they wish to use some of the information here to do further, more professionally done oral historical studies, or even interview some of the women who have provided these preliminary testimonies. Um, and with that, I uh, sorry. I believe I'm done. Um, thank you so much to everyone here um, for giving me a chance to um, speak here. And thank you to Indirapa for teaching me so much just a little bit ago. Um, so thank you. I love you all. I uh, thank you, Prakriti, for your wonderful presentation. Sorry. And uh, of course, Indirapa actually teaches us a lot about the oral history methodology and how to use it in terms of as we know that we use some narratives as ourselves, uh, but when it becomes a very underrepresented part of our society, uh, who actually are not in a sense, um, quote unquote, educated or well uh, learned or well groomed, but they have their own sense of nationalism, but um, how they're growing uh, the consciousness in themselves that actually we can get through that oral history methodology. Uh, so we have some question here. I can see uh, before uh, we start from yours, there is a question from Ummul Mohsin Mouli to Dr. Indira Choudhury. Uh, she asked that you have mentioned the term confronting mass atrocity through oral history. Could you please elaborate the method? So. Hello, 
Thank you for that question, Molly. I think it's a very important question, and especially because there has been a beginning in your Liberation War Museum where you are doing intergenerational oral histories where young people go and collect those stories and send it to the museum. I think, you know, that is something I would really like to come and see. But more formally, uh, you know, oral history in its different forms has been used to confront atrocities. Think of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Think of all these truth commissions that have happened, which have tried to, uh, you know, deal with transitional justice. And I think in some ways, of course, there has been an understanding that we will talk here, but we will try to move on. We will not try to just remember the hatred. And I think what happens, I mean, with us in India, I mean, nobody was talking about the partition and what had happened. And yet everyone observes the way in which the past keeps coming up again and again. And that's why I feel that uh, a collection of oral histories, even if there is no commission, which actually helps you understand that past, and as Prakriti put it very well, uh, helps, in this case, in her case, the women, to actually say what happened in their terms, so that their role in the whole thing is not forgotten of what they had done. And I think that is a very important point. So I think while you have these larger, you know, things like Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, they can also be efforts like museums to confront that atrocity, not just with stories of Birangonas, but stories of, you know, ordinary people and what they did and how did they come to terms with it, you know. So uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot to be said there because it's not easy interviewing a victim of trauma. It takes a lot to even start asking those questions because we are, when we look at atrocities, uh, I think what Ashish Nandi says is, as a psychotherapist, he says that, you know, it makes you confront something very dark inside yourself. So you are not able to actually go there and ask that question. So it needs some amount of, um, you know, working through to see that you are sensitive without, you know, letting the person uh, quieten down because you're not able to ask your question. Um, it's a very short answer, but, uh, you know, I'm happy to continue the conversation later. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Uh, thank you, Appa, for putting this answer so nicely. I think Molly understand what you actually shared with all of us, and uh, that would be a lot of helpful for her own project. Uh, she is also doing uh, some project related to oral history. Uh, there is another question to Prakriti. Prakriti, can you all see that from your part? Because there are two questions uh, particularly to you. So if um, you want to answer it. Is it the one about um, the sexual and gender-based violence? I see that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, the acknowledgement of sexual and gender-based violence. Is that the question? Um, so um, I think what must be noted is that this is an archive that is compiled by school children um, and um, even if I think, even if some of these eyewitnesses had been um, victims of sexual or gender-based violence, they would not necessarily admit that to someone, um, to a child for most um, of these women. So I think that might be um, a place where this project actually may fall short in terms of documenting that information. Um, so there were certain um, there were certain testimonies that talked about um, gender and sexual violence as something that happened to neighbors or other people they knew, but there were no um, birangana um, testimonies in this archive. So, um, 
And certainly mm-hmm. um, those Birangunas who have talked about their experience, many of them have faced backlash from both the family and the public. So that is definitely a possibility. Yeah, in my, uh, among mm-hmm. my interviewees, the first person I mentioned, mm-hmm. Kamla Mankekar, she talks about uh, mm-hmm. two women who were abducted and taken away by Pathan shepherds during the mm-hmm. time they were coming. And she said, you know, uh, there was a time when uh, they had traced them. And they both said, I don't think, they feared that backlash so much, they said, I don't think we'll come back. Because, you know, we have children now with these men. It's better that we stay with the children than come here. So these are some of the very difficult, uh, you know, trajectories of the past. And they really take a lot. I mean, as an oral historian, I mean, forget children. Children can't ask this. But even me, with my 60 plus years, I I just weep. I can't uh, ask or, you know, you, you need to really... Hold yourself. So it, it requires a lot. It actually sometimes uh, bringing the trauma again. Uh, sometimes uh, when oral history and do that, it feels like that maybe we are uh, actually uh, taking back their trauma again and they are going through the same experience when they're sharing their uh, stories their part of their um, uh, Indira, but do you want to sh- uh, share yeah, anything? I just want to say that, you know, now when uh, people are theorizing about particularly Holocaust and, you know, people who have gone through really severe trauma, they find that actually, uh, while what you're saying is right, that it's like revisiting the trauma, but when you ask them about it, they're able to bring it out, externalize it. And once they externalize it, they're able to sometimes also name the perpetrator. Because till they have done that, they cannot take that back into themselves and talk about, a, talk about the past differently. So in order for trauma to get over trauma, they sometimes need to externalize it. And that's why the need for very sensitive interviews. Uh, interviewers, sorry. So I, I hope... Uh, I Actually, after a few that. years, they started to open up. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And, th- and, and that is also uh, needed, that you need to say that, you know, this was done to me by... And I'm not at fault. I'm not at fault because I got raped. I have to name the perpetrator also. Yeah, so yeah, that's something that I think, you know, they are now coming to that realization. But it's yes. not easy. It's not easy if the perpetrator has been someone who's been your neighbor or someone who, you know, you knew well. So these are, uh, I mean, that's untold harm that has been done, you know, during all these moments in history. Thank you. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask directly to our panelists. Any other question in the uh, question and answer section? We are uh, almost on the eve of our session. Okay, I think our attendees already uh, got their answer. Uh, so. We do not have any other question. Uh, thank you both Indira Appa and Prakriti for both of your wonderful presentation, actually, which reaches us very much. And of course, I would like to thank Liberation War Museum. And uh, here with us, uh, Mokidul Hoksar. So if you want to say something, uh, that would be very uh, actually enriching for all of us. So can you hear me? Um, 
maybe there's some problem. And maybe Sarah are facing some problem, network okay. issue. Okay. Uh, I also think so. Maybe Sarah is facing some network Sorry. problem. Oh. Actually, able to uh, uh, unmute himself. He's yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Uh, well, uh, I don't have words to thank uh, Indira Choudhury and also our young colleague Prakriti. And I think uh, it's really a fascinating session when we looked into the oral history and uh, the connecting the two great tragedies that happened in the subcontinent, the partition narrative and the 1971 atrocities. Uh, and uh, the way the two narratives are got interconnected. And also uh, I will say that uh, uh, we have very high respect for Indira Chaudhary. She was uh, for some time past president of International Oral History Association and we actually would like to have more connectivity with uh, other oral historians and forums for oral history and so that we can uh, enrich our effort to collect oral history in our own way. And uh, these are really fascinating work. And I think uh, the panel has opened new opportunities for both of us, for also in the subcontinent, the others who are working in the oral history field and uh, I'll be happy to share with you that we are thinking about it. And Indira Choudhury has also taken this initiative to have a South Asian forum for public historians, where oral history plays a very important part. And uh, Azreen is also from Department of History. So I think uh, both in the academic uh, circle and also in the, uh, as a public historian, we have a lot to do with oral history, especially in a post-conflict society. So... Thanks to everybody and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to say a few words from Liberation War Museum. We are thankful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mofidul, for uh, organizing this. And I thank so much all for of you. Thank you so uh, much. Rain and Prakriti. Thank you. It was an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, we will always look forward uh, for our direction and collaboration with LWM in future uh, so that we could do some oral history project uh, yes. from both of our part. And I can see there's another question to Prakriti. Uh, so uh, can you give an answer very shortly, uh, Prakriti, as we are running out of time, if you wish, because uh, the session is almost over. So um, experiences regarding the oral history project, um, mainly um, I really sat down and for multiple months, I just read through almost 5,000 of these testimonies. Um, so some of it was kind of overwhelming, but um, as I mentioned, these two particular um, themes really did stand out to me while I was reading. And so that's why I decided to focus on them. Um, what was interesting to me was that I myself in my family have stories like this from my grandmother and my mother who was a teenager during the war. And so it makes me think about how um, so many of our families probably can contribute to an archive like this. And it makes me curious to see how that might come about in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you all, all the panelists and the attendees who were uh, actually uh, listening to this wonderful session and all, uh, we all became enriched from both of your presentation. And uh, thanks on behalf of Liberation War Museum. And I'll, I would also like to thank Liberation War Museum for actually giving me the opportunity to moderate this session. Uh, so we will meet again as this is a network uh, and we will get to know each other uh, through UHA, where we are all connected now. So uh, this is the end of the session. See you all in future. Best of luck.